Love y'all. I'm Alan Hayne, the Lawn Care Nut, and this is episode 18 of Lawns Across America. So welcome back. First week of June. Summer is just about two weeks away, and I just want to say thank you for hanging in there with me. I know we didn't have a podcast last week. It was Memorial Day week. I had some friends from Carbon Earth in town, as well as the week before that. I went out of town to see my folks in North Carolina. So with all that being lined up, I needed to just take a break from doing the podcast, get myself away, get a little relaxation in so I could come back here strong and we can go into summer together. And that's what we're going to talk about today is a lot of different summer lawn tips. We're going to talk about watering. We're going to talk about fertilizing the lawn during the summer, as well as we're going to even go into more pesticide labels because lots of folks are starting to use different products. If you saw my YouTube channel this past weekend, I actually did a full mosquito control across my entire property here and actually got a really good response from that. It seemed like you guys really liked that. You like that content. But that also did bring up a lot of people asking, hey, is this pet safe? Is this kid safe? You know, we're doing this so we can enjoy our lawns, but then again, what am I doing after that and what kind of possible risk am I exposing myself to? So we're going to talk about that in this week's podcast as well. But I wanted to start off this week real quick with kind of a testimonial from someone that that came in and, and more of a testimonial. It's just about someone sharing with you some things they've done in the lawn that I know will appeal to some of you as well and might give you some ideas on how you can get back out there. Because one of the other things that happens this time of year is, you know, you kind of gung-ho in the spring. You were on it, man. You were pushing hard. You were out there every week mowing. You were doing things like you knew you should, and you were seeing results. And now summer's here, and summer changes things. You go on vacation. The kids are home now. They're not in school, so you have another level of responsibility to deal with there. Other things come up in the summer. Maybe you just want to get out and golf a little bit more. Maybe your work is a little slower in the summer. Whatever the case may be, you realize that summer changes things. It's like a pattern interrupt to what you had going on well in the spring. And so I want to give you some tips to kind of continue through summer so you don't, and I don't want to say lose the momentum that you gained. Because by the way, anytime you start taking care of the lawn and you learn and you become better at lawn care and your lawn improves, you don't ever lose those gains. Now, we're going to use a couple analogies today when, it talk, when I talk about gains and gains being a weightlifter or someone on a bulking cycle. We are going to talk about that, but you never lose those gains. It's the same reason why I hide behind all of these big baggy shirts and all of this different apparatus and equipment and why I keep my selfie stick neck up because I have some leftovers from when I was in high school and college and I made some gains in my chest those gains have now sunken and they don't look very good and they're not very flattering, but they are still there. I never lost those gains. They've just changed. And that's the same how thing it works with a lawn. So don't think if you've gone lax a little bit or if you've lost a little bit of momentum from the spring and things are starting to go backwards, don't be concerned. You're better and your lawn is better. It just may be that you need to adjust your strategy for this particular season, not only the season of the year, summer, which requires a little bit different type of an attack, but also the season of your life being a little bit different at the same time. All right, so this one comes out of Cincinnati, Ohio. And again, I think this is going to speak to a lot of you folks. Hi there, I'm Greg. I found your YouTube channel a couple of weeks ago, and I'm loving it. After a lifetime of hating mowing, really hating it, I am trying to learn to enjoy the mow. Last week was the first time I've cut twice in a week, and I actually didn't mind it. Heck, those were some of the first times I've not minded mowing, period. Understanding what the lawn needs and why it behaves the way it does has been huge for me. I like to understand things rather than just do them because, which is probably why I hated mowing, because it was a chore that I just had to do, rather than understanding how things work in order to have a nicer lawn. So I want to stop there because there's more to this. So Greg is saying, I finally like mowing because I understand why I'm mowing and I understand what to expect from it. And that's why I always tell you guys, I can tell you what to do. I can tell you to cut high. I can tell you to cut often. But I always try to give you the why behind it. And of course, that's a lot of the things we talk about here on the podcast and on my YouTube channel. But I want you to understand that working with your lawn, it's like any relationship. The more you understand the other person, or in this case, the more you understand your lawn and its soil then the more you can feed it to make the relationship healthy. It works that way in marriages and everything else, right? If you understand your, your spouse or your significant other, if you have empathy for them, if you work hard to understand what makes them happy, what their love language is, what they like, what they don't like, then you can work to improve the relationship by feeding the good things and encouraging the good things and encouraging them and making a positive impact on them And in return, they will do that back. They will reciprocate. That's just how relationships work. And the same thing works with the lawn. The more you understand it, 
And the more you give it what it needs and what it wants and work it through the tough times, the more it will reward you back by being in thick and lush and beautiful, and you'll get those barefoot days on it. So just wanted to point that out, that, that that's exactly how we cross over. The lawn care relationship is very much like any other relationship in your life, and the things that you learn in caring for a lawn and striving with a lawn and working through tough times with a lawn and good times with a lawn, that can actually improve all relationships, even ones at work, ones with your kids, ones with your family. It can improve all of your relationships. And I know some of you get a little cringy when I go, or you think I get a little cringy when I go that far with it, but I promise you, it all works together. Everything is the same. There's nothing new under the sun. All right, let's continue here. Greg says, just yesterday I bought your program, The Cool Season Guide, since I'm in Southwest Ohio. He has cool season turf, and I can't wait to get started on it. I mapped out my yard a couple weeks ago and used the online tools as well as actually measuring it, which was a nice excuse to buy a 100-foot tape measure and have my six-year-old son help me outside. Right now, I'm trying to figure out how to best water everything. This weekend, I'm planning to throw down some grub acts as directed in the supplemental guide of getting started in the summer. And we currently have True Green. And while they do okay, I'm considering canceling them and doing it myself. We'll see how the Grub X goes. I've never even considered doing this myself before because it was just too daunting and I didn't know where to start. So your channel podcast guide have been fantastic. And that's really the point of this message. I just wanted to let you know I really appreciate what you're doing. So thank you. So Greg, I really appreciate what you're doing and telling me this because it it just... It goes back to solidify everything that I try to do, which is that I really want you to understand that lawn care is not that, that tough and that you can actually get a lot of good out of it. We talked about the good that you get about enjoying it and, and the relationships and that, but look at what you can do with your son. First of all, yes, any chance you can get to buy a tape measure, I mean, I'm with you. Like For some reason, whenever I go to the big box store, I always pick up a tape measure or a level, but yet I can never find a tape measure or a level. But something about tape measures... You know, maybe wrenches too, like multi-tools. I pick up a lot of those. But tape measures, I probably own 20 tape measures, and I bet you right now I couldn't find one. But either way, any excuse to buy a tape measure is good. But like he said, he got out and measured it on the online tools, and I recommend that. But what do I always tell you guys? Get out there and measure your lawn on your own. Measure it manually. Use that, that, uh, that tape measure. Walk it off. Step it off. Feel what 1,000 square foot feels like. Learn what 2,500 square foot is over here where it's a perfect square versus 2,500 square foot over here where it's a triangle. And what differences will I have to adjust to as I'm applying this, as I'm mowing it, as I'm even weed whacking or as I'm, you know, whatever things you're doing, learn your land. And then as Greg has discovered, he's actually used it now as an opportunity to get out with his son and do some things in the lawn. You can teach your son about a tape measure, right? Even though he's only six, it doesn't matter. Let him pull it out. Show him the numbers on there. Count the numbers. Let him be out in the lawn with dad. That is one of the most incredible experiences I think that a young man or a young lady can have is to have experiences in the lawn with their mom and dad. I think that is just incredible. One of my favorite pictures that I have is actually of me and my dad, and I don't remember it because I think I was only one and a half or two years old, working on his old craftsman riding lawnmower. We used to live on Shore Acres out out in St. Pete and I have some fond memories of running around the lawn while my dad was mowing it and working on it. So I think those are always good things, and that's what else Greg is discovering here. But the one thing I want to say, Greg, as far as doing the Grub app, and yes, a Grub application is a great one to start with. If you're somebody that's listening right now and you have not started your lawn care, it is not too late. If you do get my guide, you can go to thelawncarenut.com. We have guides for cool season and warm season turf. And it also comes now with a supplement guide, which is a getting started guide, because getting started in the summer can be a little bit daunting. And we're going to talk about a lot of the things you're facing here in the summer in this podcast. But with that, though, you want to have somewhere to get started. And so what I do with the supplement guide is I show you how to throw down a grub application. I use two products there. And the reason I do that is because you're not going to hurt the lawn with a grub application. By the way, you're not going to hurt the lawn with 99% of the stuff we talk about. That's another thing we're going to talk about today is this myth of burning the lawn. That's not going to be a concern for you, but especially with grub X, not going to happen. It's an insecticide. It goes into the soil. It's going to harm insects. It's not going to harm the lawn, even if you get heavy handed with it. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you to use all of the strategies that we lay out. I'm telling you to measure your product. I'm telling you to learn what the product is, work on your spread. I'm telling you to work on all of those things, knowing in the background, if you make a mistake, you're not going to hurt anything. And the next time you won't make that same mistake again, because that's the other thing with lawn care. You only make a mistake once. You really do. And you won't ever make it again. So that's the first thing. He's working on, hey, I'm going to kind of start to work myself in here, and I'm going to start with that grub application. And that's what you get when you get the guides right now. So that's a free addition. Here's the thing, though, Greg, I would say is True Green has a way of bundling in these products, especially, or these applications, especially in Ohio. I know I used to work at the Dayton North Branch of True Green. It was in Huber Heights. 
I think it was in Huber Heights, but either way, it was called Dayton North. And I also worked at the Springboro branch, which is a little bit closer to you. Springboro's right in the middle of Centerville, Ohio, and Cincinnati, Ohio. I worked out of Springboro. I don't think we serviced where you live, but either way, in that area, I can tell you that Grub apps are a big deal, big moneymaker for them. And these days, what they'll do is bundle it in. So if you bought, purchased a six application product or, whoa, sorry about that, Flamingo. If you purchased a six application program from True Green, I can guarantee you probably the Grub application is included. So Greg, make sure you call them and find out. Just tell them not to do the Grub app. I don't know if you'll have to work that out of your prepay, auto pay, but whatever. But again, you don't want a double Grub app. It's not going to hurt anything, but it'd just be a waste. So that's the first thing I would say is call them, make sure they're not doing a Grub app. Secondly, I would say get all of your invoices that they've left you for this year and read every one of them, man. Just read all the products that are on there. They'll tell you the FERT analysis, whether it was liquid or granular. They'll tell you what they put down and when and why. I encourage you to do that, to dig into that, to understand the why behind everything they're doing. So as you decide that you're going to take it over, you can you know, kind of take it up a level from where they are. Now, let's talk about watering, because Greg also mentioned that one of the things he wants to do is figure out, okay, I'm going to get my watering right. And I talk about that a lot. If you got my email blast this last week here, that also talks a lot about watering. Make sure you're irrigating. So he's talking about that. So let me give you some advice on watering. And I'm going to assume that you're manually watering here. And I'm going to assume that most of you that are listening to this, you're manually watering. You don't have an in-ground sprinkler system. That would be a different conversation. I'm thinking about you that are moving sprinklers. And my Lawn up in Northwest Indiana, I moved sprinklers for all of the 10 or 12 years that I lived there. I moved sprinklers around everywhere all the time. I used impact sprinklers, and we have videos that I've done on that as well as I talked about that in my most recent email. But one of the things you can do, since, Greg, you already have a property map that you've already made, you already measured your lawn, you've already sectioned it off, which is good. That's the first step that anybody should do in any lawn care program is measure your lawn and section it off and make a property map. Very simple way to get started. Now what you do is you literally draw on the map. And I'll be doing this in my video this weekend on my YouTube channel, so subscribe there to the Lawn Care Nut. But you literally use that same map and you put dots on the map at your best manual sprinkler location. So let's see if I've got one impact sprinkler that I can run at a time. Most of you aren't gonna have enough water pressure to run more than two sprinklers at a time, but the majority of you will only run one at a time. It's just how it ends up working. So I got my one sprinkler, and what I'm going to do is go to each area or each mapped out area or zone that I've already created in my measurement, and I'm going to see the best optimum spots to put the sprinkler that it can cover those spots. Once I know those most optimum spots, then I'm going to set out my tuna can, and I'm going to take the tuna can challenge, and what that is is I'm going to set the sprinkler in that optimum spot, and I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to set the tuna can out in the middle of it, and when that tuna can, I want to start a timer, by the way, and when that tuna can gets a half inch of water in it, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to mark that down on the property map. So section one, position one of irrigation, you know, 15 minutes. Then I'm going to go to another section. And each section of your lawn, depending how big it is, you may have to put your sprinkler in two different spots. Some might be small enough that you put them in one different spot. Some might be oblong so that the sprinkler doesn't have to have as wide of a coverage area or not. But this is all part of learning that land and learning that adjustment. And basically from there, going forward, you pick your spots. Once you've mapped out every spot, and again, we're gonna, I'm going to show you this in detail. I have an in-ground sprinkler system, but I'm going to show you how to manually map it out at my property here. In Florida, I'm going to do that this weekend on the YouTube channel, Lawn Care. Now, I'm going to show you how to map out each one of these spots, each one of these areas, so that you can very easily then know ahead of time when it's time to water, where you put your sprinkler, how long you got to leave it there. Now, I can tell you that in the hottest days in the summer, every grass type, I don't care what grass type it is, is going to need to get watered every three days. Now, I'm talking about up in the north in the cool season lawns, in the cool season lawn areas, up in Cincinnati, for sure. When you get those days... Cincinnati, which is a little further south than I lived up in northwest Indiana, for sure you're going to get those long stretches of 90 degree days. When you get that, your turf type tall fescue, your Kentucky bluegrass, your perennial ryegrass, it's not going to like that. I don't care how deep the roots are. I don't care how much you water it. It's not going to like that. So you're going to need to give it additional irrigation just to keep it going through the heat stress. And that's going to be every three days. And in some cases, it might even need to be more. You might need to do a little bit of cool down and syringing in the afternoon. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the video coming up this weekend. But the idea being that you might actually be watering your lawn nearly every day when you water manually. That's because you can't do everything all in one time. You don't have large sweeping areas. You have one single sprinkler that you might have to move around an eight or 10,000 square foot lawn. And when you do that, that means you might have to have it running every single morning for an hour or every single afternoon for an hour or God forbid in the evenings. By the way, a lot of people will ask me, Alan, if I can't water in the morning, what do I do? Well, then you water in the evening. 
I tell you not to water in the evening because that's the best practice. The best idea is to not water in the evening because what can happen is the water sits there warm all night. And if there is disease present, it can allow that disease triangle to come together and fungus can break out. And then you're going to have that problem. However, what's worse? No water and going into summer dormancy or dealing with a little bit of disease? Well, you got to kind of weigh out your options there. And personally, because I like to grow a lawn, I like my lawn to stay green all summer, I would rather risk a little bit of disease rather than not water. So if your work schedule is such that you cannot water in the mornings and you cannot water in the afternoons, your work schedule says, I have to water in the evenings, then watering in the evenings is better than not watering at all. So figure out your best watering times. And from there, now what you know is each section on your map where you put the sprinkler. So you got seven days a week that you can water. And again, I'm not talking about watering restrictions. That's a whole nother ball of wax that we can get into. So I'm just pretending nobody has watering restrictions right now and that you're going to figure this out. You're going to water every single evening. Let's say that out of the five sections in your lawn, there are 10 points where you have to put the sprinkler. That means that every night you're going to have to put the sprinkler in two different places. So the way I would manage this is I almost look at it like kind of like how a busy family manages kids during sports. I mean, you guys have all known people that have had like three or four kids and they're all in those ages where they're all playing sports. Maybe they're playing baseball and soccer and football and whatever other sports all can overlap spring sports type of thing. You know, those all overlap. And what do you do when you can only get those kids to practice into games and you only have two cars, but you have four kids? What do you do? Well, you manage it. And in some cases, little Johnny might have to get to his practice 30 minutes early so that way Susie can get to her game on time. And maybe Johnny then will have to stay at his practice 30 minutes later because Susie's game will end later. Or maybe Susie has to be picked up later so you can get Johnny. Or maybe Susie has to go and stay at a friend's house for a little while so you can get... You see how that works. You're managing schedules. And that's how you manage your water. Manage it just like a family manages their kids, right? So I know that when I come home on Mondays, I'm going to set the sprinkler out for 45 minutes in section one. But hey, I need to go to bed early tonight because I got to be up in the morning. So I'm going to have to cut section one off 10 minutes early so I can get to section two and at least get some there. But you know what? I'll make that up later in the week. You know, you can manage it that way. Also, another way to look at it is to manage it like you're cooking. If you watch people that are really good at cooking, they'll have a four burner stove and they'll have four different things going on that stove. And all those different things do not cook at the same rate. They don't need the same temperature. They might need things added to them at different times. They may need to be taken on and off the heat. They might need to be strained, whatever it is. It might need to be moved to a different vessel. But for some reason, people can, can do that. They can multitask on that cooking surface. And that's the same way you do this with the lawn. You multitask the sections of the lawn, and the best way to multitask the sections of the lawn are to first understand your best spots. Pick your best spots so you know where to put that sprinkler and get your watering done as efficiently as possible. Now, you're not going to be perfect. Sometimes you're going to burn the bacon. It's just going to happen. Sometimes Johnny's going to have to miss a game because it's just how it works. We've only got two cars. We've only got so much time, and, and mom's got to be out of town on a business trip. So, Johnny, you're going to have to miss your game. Or maybe that's where you ask a neighbor to help you out, and the neighbor takes Johnny to his game so he doesn't have to miss it. Maybe the neighbor can help you turn your sprinklers on and off. Hey, uh, Ed, next door. Hey, brah, I, I put my sprinkler in a backyard. Listen, I got to work a double shift tonight. I'm not going to be home. Sprinkler's sitting back there. Would you mind going over 5 o'clock and turning it on for me? Leave it on for like 45 minutes. If you do, text me when you turn it on. I'll text you, remind you to turn it off when it's over. Or you can even get individual timers. A lot of different options there, but manual watering doesn't have to be something that you just go out and guess at. It doesn't have to be something that you're spraying and praying. You can literally dial it in. And, and keep in mind, you don't have to do this much watering for very long. Most of you where you live, this may only be a three-week stretch that it needs this much water, even less than that, unless we have a drought situation. For the most part, though, and I remember this living in Northwest Indiana, having a healthy turf-type tall fescue lawn that had deep roots, for the most part, I could get away with watering the lawn only on weekends, maybe once during the week I might have to do it. But still, I knew the best spots. I also would water by feel. I would look at the areas that were weak, and those are where I would go first. And I had other areas that I knew were stronger that didn't need as much water that maybe got a little more shade, and I would hit those a little less often. That's what you get to eventually. Creating these very specific maps and mapping things out and understanding timing and all of that is what you do in the beginning so that after a couple years, even after a year, after one season, you're really managing a lot of this on feel. And you just know what areas are going to check out sooner than others. And you won't have to have this massive schedule like this. That's kind of like as your kids grow up and one of them begins driving, you don't need to worry about them as much more. They are much more independent and they don't need you to take them to the games as much more. So you can focus on the children that are not grown, that are still growing, that still need your help 
that much more. So those are some really good analogies. I, at least I think they're really good analogies. And I hope those help you out, Greg. I know you're going to do great. I hope you have a great season. I'm really glad that you're progressing along the line. And as always, I'm going to hope for the best. So some of you may be noticing it is very hot. I'm sweating out here. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm in the garage. A lot of you have recommended that I get a mini split, which is an air conditioner for a small garage or for a shop like this. It's compact and it works really well. The challenge I have is, though, is we do have a very strict HOA here, and I'm even that mini split, even though it's a small outside unit, I don't have anywhere that I can put that, that it'll be hidden, that the HOA would approve. So I think what I'm going to have to do, and by the way, I don't have a problem with HOAs. I was just talking to my friend Connor Ward about that, and he's like, you got to move out of that place that they got the HOA, but I, I don't mind living in an area that has an HOA to each his own. Everybody's got their own thing. Our HOA is fairly strict, and I like that because it just keeps things looking nice, but... Over and above all that, I think what I'm going to have to do is move this podcast into my office, which I kind of, you know, like this ideal situation out here in the garage. I like the way it looks. I like the way it comes across. I like the way the background is. I worked really hard to get it going, but I'm thinking that uh, that's not going to work long term. So I'm probably going to have to move things inside. But in the meantime, I'm going to be sweating it out out here in the garage. And I think the street cleaner is even going by outside, which is another one of those things. If you can hear it in the background, I don't know. So my grand ideas about having the podcast out here in the garage are going to have to move. Maybe I'll get something a little better Joe Rogan style one day. <laughs> I have to sell a lot of Carbon X for that. All right. Okay, the next thing I did want to talk about real quick, and this is going to lead into a lot of the other things that we are going to talk about in the podcast today, and that is the way the weather is going across the country. It seems like it's been a little bit wild this spring from down here in Florida where we haven't had rain in four weeks, and we are now in our rainy season, and we haven't gotten some, I think, Lakeland in mid some of the central part of Florida got a little bit of rain yesterday. St. Pete definitely did. But down here in the Bradenton area, we got nothing. We are still hot and dry. And the St. Augustine lawns here are really seeing it. Even me with my, I was on top of my irrigation. I anticipated this. Even I am finding weak areas in my irrigation where it cannot cover with this much heat and this much dry. Our St. Augustine grass here, which was what most of us have, loves the heat over 90 and it's doing great, but it's got to have tons of water to support that. It's got to be able to stay hydrated. It's like a marathon runner, right? If you take a marathon runner and you don't give them water during the race, I don't care how good of a marathon runner they are. I don't care how long they like to run distance. They are not going to be able to finish that race. And that's exactly how the St. Augustine grass is. It's like, bro, I love the heat. I will be stoliniferous and strong and I will take over everything, but you have to supply me with enough water. And that just hasn't happened. We get that from Mother Nature, though, because we get heavy downpours from Mother Nature every single day in Florida, pretty much. And that keeps that St. Augustine running strong, especially because here, those heavy downpours come like at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, right when it's about to stress out. Bam, it gets a nice, cool dose of rain. We haven't had that. And the majority of people were not ready for that. And even if they were, like I said, like me, I've still got some areas that are exposed. And I'm actually having to hand water those during the day. I do have that luxury that I can go out and I can hand water and give myself some cooling water. And so what I'm doing in the toughest spots of my St. Augustine grass and the areas that are suffering the most, I'm trying to simulate those afternoon rains. So every day, about two or three o'clock in the afternoon, I go out and I just literally syringe them. I just hose them down deeply. I don't linger long, but I get as much water down in those weak spots as I can. And I notice that, you know, a couple hours later, it's, it's back and looking good. It's green back up and everything else. And the reason I wanted to point that out is because No matter what happens, I need you guys to understand that I am the ultimate lawn care nut. I want you to think about something. When I just gave you that statement that I'm going out every afternoon and I'm watering my lawn, most of you said to yourselves, yeah, dude, because you're at home all day and and I, I work a day job and I'm not able to do that. And I'm like, yeah, that's why I'm the ultimate lawn care nut. I literally worked for 10 years to be able to quit my day job so that when this day came, when this four week stretch in Florida came and my St. Augustine was, was struggling and everyone else's is looking terrible, this day came and I have set it up for 10 years so that I can be here now to water this lawn in the afternoons and keep it looking green. And I'm saying all of that to say, if you have St. Augustine grass in Florida and you're not able to keep up with the watering, just have patience, do the best that you can We are going to get our rainy season coming back in. It's not going to do permanent damage to the lawn. As long as you are trying to get some water on there a couple days a week, it's going to be fine. Even though it might look bad, it's going to come back. I promise you not panic. So that's what we've been dealing with down here in Florida and even a lot of the deep south and through Georgia and that they've had the same kind of thing. Then a lot of you guys, though, up in through the Midwest and all the way up in even Nebraska have had massive flooding, terrible floods, just I I don't know if I've seen floods like that in a long time. At least I'm watching the news, and it seems like it's really bad. So tons of flooding up that way, and then all the way up into the 
upper Midwest over into the east and the northeast, you guys have had record rainfall, massive amounts of rainfall this spring. And I can tell you that no matter what you face, whether it's the heat zap that we've had down here, heat and drought zap, or dry spell, or the flooding that you've had up through Oklahoma and all the way up through the rest of the uh, Midwest that way, the center of the Midwest, or the heavy rains up into Michigan and over in Indiana and all the way up through the east and northeast, all of those things are going to zap the soil and all of those things are going to zap the lawn. They're going to definitely zap the soil though and we're going to need to replenish nutrients in the soil for whatever reason, for no matter what you face. But the one thing that you do not want to do is go out and just destroy the lawn with a ton of nitrogen. You don't want to just go out and kick it. Either way, I don't know what the summer's going to look like, but I do know that we're going to get some heat spells that are going to zap it again. And the last thing we want to do is start kicking it back in, right? Coming out of a flood, coming out of heavy rains that washed everything out of the soil, coming out of this heat spell. We don't want to kick it in too hard because we're not sure what's coming up, so we want to take it in slow. And so that's what I want to go to with our next question here. And this one comes from John, and John is north of Boston. So I'm going to set John's question up here. And John actually started his year with a pre-emergent that contained nitrogen in it. So it was a full, you know, pre-emergent herbicide with nitrogen in it. And now here's what he says. He says, I have a couple questions, and I'm hoping you could help me with. Do you think throwing down four more applications of malorganite will be too much given my pre-emergent contained a full application of nitrogen? I threw that down the beginning of May, and I figured I'd do a Milo app either this week or next week, delayed Memorial Day app, and then do another one in July, maybe some microgreen RGS, do another one on Labor Day, another one on Thanksgiving. Does that sound appropriate? So that's what his question is. How much nitrogen is too much? And I can tell you that four more applications of malorganite over the next year over on the holiday schedule is definitely not going to be too much. It's not going to be too much at all. I was actually talking to Matt Martin this weekend or this last week when he was here, and he was saying, you know, Alan, when you recommend three quarter pounds of nitrogen, he goes, you realize that's not really that much when you look at what a lot of folks have recommended over the years. And I remember that back in the True Green days, we used to put down a pound, a pound and a quarter of nitrogen each application. We would do that quite often to really kick in the lawn. And the most I ever recommend is three quarter pound of nitrogen. So the answer here is no, five applications of year, a year of, of, of nitrogen, whether it's malorganite or whatever it is, no, that's not too much at all. Now he says here, my other question is about carbon X. I'm really impressed with the results I've seen from the YouTube videos and pictures from other lawn care nuts. If I were to pick up a bag, would that be a substitute for malorganite or something to use in conjunction with it? If it does replace it, would that only replace one Milo app or would that be a complete replacement for Milo? Okay, so let's continue working this through. Let's continue thinking about this. So he applied a full application of nitrogen in the spring and that was probably like a Scott's product. So I'm gonna tell you that was probably a full pound of nitrogen that he had in the early spring with his pre-emergent. Then he's gonna do, or he's so, so far planning to do four more applications of Malorganite. He's gonna follow the holiday schedule like a delayed Memorial Day app. He's gonna do a July 4th, a Labor Day and a Thanksgiving. That's fine. That's not too much at all. In fact, you could do a lot more of that. What I would rather you do is look at times of the year. In other words, push higher amounts of nitrogen in spring, three quarter pound, three quarter pound, three quarter pound, and much less in the summer, half pound, half pound, half pound. So the idea would be we're going to feed it every four to five weeks, no matter what, as long as you're irrigating just a little bit less nitrogen in the summer so you're not pushing too much growth. And so that's where we can get into, well, can I use Carbon X or something else? So the first thing I want you to realize is I don't care what fertilizer you use and neither does your grass. The fertilizer just wants the NPK and it mostly wants the nitrogen. Never forget, nitrogen drives the bus. If you want a thick green lawn, you need nitrogen. The other things are great. Potassium for stress relief, phosphorus for helping with rooting and growth. Those types of things are needed for sure. You know, micronutrients to support photosynthesis. These things are all needed. But the thing that is needed the most is nitrogen. Nitrogen drives the bus, never forget that. So you can get your nitrogen from Scott's Turf Builder, you can get it from Sunnyland All Natural, you can get it from Malorganite, you can get it from 1801 Green Punch, which is a liquid, you can get it from Carbon X, you can get it from Streaming Green, you can get it from Lesco, you can get it from Walmart 202020. It doesn't matter what you choose, it just matters that you're getting it down. And in that case, I would say that in the early part of the spring, three quarter pounds of nitrogen per application in the summer, a half pound. Now, that's where the math comes in and that's where people think, well, I don't wanna understand the math, but yes, you do, because you wanna have control of your strategy. You wanna know what you're doing and why, and you wanna know when you can turn it up and you wanna know when you can back it down. So remember, I'm telling you, we wanna still keep getting fertilizer down every four to five weeks, as long as you're irrigating. 
and as long as you can keep up with the mowing. You just wanna back it down a little bit in the summer. So let me give you two ways to look at it then. Instead of, is this too much fertilizer? Let me look, get you to look at it this way. Think of a weightlifter that goes on a bulking cycle. So somebody that is wanting to bulk up, maybe he's preparing for a show, and actually I shouldn't say weightlifter, bodybuilder. A bodybuilder that is gonna prepare for a show. What is that bodybuilder gonna do? Well, he's gonna start bulking up on protein. That's what he's gonna do. If you wanna build muscle, protein drives the bus. You can put all the other stuff in. You can take creatine all you want. You can take pre-workout all you want. You can take vitamin supplements all you want. That's not gonna build muscle. That's gonna support the, the rest of the body systems, but the way that you build muscle is protein. Protein is the building block, and that's what you need to ingest. So if you want to lift a lot of weight and break down a lot of muscle and build the muscle back up, you're gonna bulk yourself up with protein. But you're not gonna do that year round. A weightlifter is not gonna eat 30 eggs every single morning and take down copious amounts of steak and chicken and tuna and drink all these shakes. They're not gonna do that year round. What do they do? They have a bulking cycle that they go into as they prepare for a show. And then when they're in the off season, they kind of treat things differently. Some of them let themselves go a little bit more than others, but you can always tell that they're a bodybuilder. And in fact, some people in their off season will go more towards cardio and they will lean out and they will work on their lung function and they will work on their endurance and they will work on their lean muscle type, fast twitch type stuff. And again, I'm not super into this and don't understand it super amounts, but you understand that the diet is different during a bulking cycle than it is during a cardio cycle or a thinning cycle or a cutting cycle maybe is what they call it. That's the same analogy with your lawn. So think of spring as a bulking cycle. Push the nitrogen. Instead of pushing three quarter pound, if you really want to, push a full pound every four to five weeks in the spring as things are growing, as things are coming out. Push it, especially if you have Bermuda. Push it, especially if you have St. Augustine. Push it, ah, push it. No matter what you do, push that nitrogen. But when you come into summer now, things are gonna slow down. Think about yourself when you're outside in the heat and it's really humid and it's really hot, you slow down. In fact. I call it the turtle walk. I love to be outside when it's 95 degrees here and 100% humidity. I love it, but I definitely move slow like a turtle and I'm always seeking shade, but I'm out and I'm moving and I'm sweating and things are still going. And by the way, it takes a lot different type of endurance to work in 95 degree heat with 100% humidity than it does to work in 72 degree temperatures with no humidity. Totally different. Or to work at altitude in Denver at 72 degrees with no humidity. It takes a really different type of a fitness level, and that's kind of how your lawn can be. The fitness level that your lawn will, will withstand in the spring is much different in the summer, and the reason the summer is so different is because of everything we've talked about, it's because of the heat. Now, in the north, in the cool season, that also means you're gonna get less water. Down here in the south, when things pick up, it means we're gonna get more water, but the variable is the heat, and heat is something that will definitely slow down all grass types when it's at extremes. So I would not recommend that you put yourself on a bulking cycle in the summer, no matter what your grass type is. Instead, I would recommend you lean out. Maybe go for more supplement type things such as some iron and some micronutrients. Sure, you do want to put in a little bit of nitrogen, but you want to spoon feed it in. You want to put it in slow just to keep things moving because now we're in the summer, the long, hot summer, and we want the lawn to train for endurance. We want it to train for that long marathon. We want it to train to keep going through the heat and through the stress. So look at it that way. It's not about too much nitrogen. It's more about what kind of a cycle are you on and how is the weather dictating that type of a cycle. Now, one other thing I did want to add on here, we've been talking about bulking cycles and nutrients and all that kind of thing, is to these weather extremes that we have been facing around the country. We've had extreme heat in the south. We've had extreme flooding and extreme rains. When your lawn is coming out of that cycle, you could consider that like a cycle, right? That's more of a, a sickness cycle or a weather cycle, right? When your lawn is coming out of that and it's ready to go back to getting fit again, you're ready to get it back in shape again, what you don't wanna do is hammer it too hard with nitrogen right out the gate. I know I say nitrogen drives the bus, but in the case when you're coming out of some sort of stress, then things are a little bit different. Think about this, if you're coming off the football field after playing four hard quarters, you don't immediately have a blue cheese wedge with bacon and a steak. You wait a few hours before you have that. The first thing you get coming off the field is a Gatorade. And the reason you want Gatorade or Powerade is because you wanna restore, obviously you wanna rehydrate, you wanna restore fluids, but you also wanna restore minerals and electrolytes. Those are the things that you need immediately. And that's the same with the lawn when it's coming off of a tough period, like a flood or a drought or a heat stress period, you don't wanna just hammer it with nitrogen. What is better to do is to feed it in slow. You wanna give it some nitrogen, you wanna get it going, but you definitely wanna get it some potassium. That's gonna help it recover from stress. You definitely wanna get it some micronutrients in small doses, spoon feeding in, bring it back slowly. And as you feel like it's recovered, 
and you know that the irrigation is in line and you know you can keep it hydrated, that's when you can start hammering it with some medium rare steak. But I just wanna caution you, coming out of these heavy periods, don't hammer it too hard at fast. Now the second thing you can look at though is when you are putting down that fertilizer, because again, I don't care what fertilizer you use, but are you only putting down the nutrients or maybe are you trying to strengthen the rest of the systems in the lawn at the same time? You know, I mean, I can take straight just protein and it's gonna give me what I need, protein, but maybe I wanna take a protein shake that also includes a lot of essential vitamins and minerals in it. Maybe it's got some other things that'll help support what the protein synthesis is doing. And that's kinda of how fertilizer works. You know, you can use a Scott's Turf Builder, which is just the nutrients and it's gone, or you can use Carbon X, which leaves behind biochar, which creates condominiums for microbes to live in and for roots to live in, where they can kinda of be in a symbiotic relationship. Maybe you wanna use Maybe you want to use 1801 Green Punch that has humic acid in it, which also adds carbon to the soil, which helps to chelate natural nutrients that are there. So think about your fertilizer that way. Nitrogen drives the bus, but what else am I going to go ahead and get in there that's also going to help the soil in, this, in the process of me in my bulking cycle or of me taking my nitrogen? And so this brings me to the next point that I want to talk about, and that's talking about us. You guys are going to be out in the heat, and I want to give you some quick tips here because when I worked for True Green, I did learn a lot of things because our guys would work in the heat and we would have some, some health challenges every once in a while and we would do some things to mitigate those by giving them some training as well as my father was a fireman here in St. Petersburg, Florida for 25 years. Now I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine being a firefighter in Florida. You think there's heat in a burning building? Imagine if it happens at noon on the hottest day. That is a really tough thing. So I talked to my dad and he gave me some tips too. And the first thing is, you need to start hydrating the night before your lawn work. And I know some of you are going to be like, oh, you're going to be our mom now? And yeah, there is, because I want you to be able to enjoy your lawn care. I want you to be able to enjoy what you're doing out there. And part of that is being healthy when you're doing it. So I recommend you start hi hydrating the night before. Don't drink a lot of alcohol the night before you're going to go out on the lawn. Save the alcohol for later. Uh, you want to be well hydrated. Start hydrating in the morning. I limit the coffee on mornings that it's going to be super hot or on days that it's going to be very hot. And I work in the heat of the day. That's just what I like. But on those days, I limit my coffee and I drink like a whole pot. I'll drink coffee like all day black. But on days when I'm going to be out in the lawn and it's going to be super hot out, I limit my coffee and I add more water in the morning. So the first key to being healthy when you're out working in the heat is to stay hydrated and to prehydrate. The second thing is as you're hydrating during the day, you do not want to drink cold water. For some reason, and there's, I read all kinds of stuff online about this, that drinking cold water, what it does is when your body is very hot and you drink ice cold water, what it does is it causes your body to think your stomach or your internals are hyperthermic. It rushes all the blood to around your stomach, which means all the blood leaves your head and your extremities. You get lightheaded and you can pass out. That sounds logical. I don't know how true that is, honestly, but I do know for sure that if you drink ice cold water and you're really, really hot, the chances are very likely that you will pass out and that you might throw up in the process. I've seen it happen more than enough times, and my dad said he's seen it too more than enough times. Guys come out of a hot fire, and they slam a bunch of ice-cold Gatorade or water, and they get lightheaded, they get nauseous, and they will throw up. For some reason, it's just not good to go from one extreme to another. I recommend drinking what I call garage temperature water, and here I am in the garage here drinking garage temperature water. I, ha uh, I bring it from my house. My house is set at 77, our air conditioner is, and I bring it out here in the garage, and I keep it in the shade in the garage, and it does not get too hot. Now, it gets a little bit warmer than it would be inside the house for sure, but I start with garage temp water, and that's what I drink all day is garage temp water. The other thing that I'll do is you guys see me wear these neck buffs all the time. I will drench those down with water and twirl them in the air and put them back on and they will keep your neck cool. For some reason, if I keep my neck cool, it helps to keep the rest of my body cool. Of course, you see that I wear fishing shirts and all that. That's because I'm trying to avoid the sun. Uh, this is Florida and skin cancer is something that's affected a lot of friends of mine. So I always try to cover up anyway. That's another good reason to wear a neck buff. But either way, I want you to keep your neck cool. That's another thing to do. Now, as you're going to go in and cool off after a long day, you should definitely have a cool down period in your garage. I usually take 15 or 20 minutes and I sit in the garage and continually drink the garage temp water. And then just before I'm about to go in, I'll have my wife give me a room temperature inside the house water and I will drink that. So that's a little bit cooler, 77 degrees. And usually 15, 20 minutes of having some inside the house cooler water and I'm pretty good and I can go inside and everything is cool and I'll take a shower. Now the worst thing that ever happens and some of you guys that live in Florida will experience this is when you're sweating after you get out of the shower. That's the worst feeling in the world is to continue sweating after you get out of the shower. And if that happens, it means you didn't cool down little, you didn't cool down in the garage long enough. 
I do not like to continue sweating after my shower. Even though in Florida, it's kind of unavoidable. If you ever come down here to Florida and you realize, oh my gosh, I'm sweating all day, just realize that everyone else is sweating all day too, and everyone else has swast marks on the back of their pants as well. The last thing I will tell you is, is after a hot day of work and after you're out working, don't go get in an air-conditioned car. Same exact thing will happen. In fact, we used to unhook the air conditioners at True Green. We'd order, you know, Ford F-350s brand new. They would come in with great air conditioning, and our mechanic would unhook those. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not, but we would because guys would be out in the heat, and in between stops, they'd get in an air-conditioned car, and they would get headaches, and they would throw up, and they never knew why, and it was something to do with that cold, dry air coming out of hot, humid air into cold, dry air in an, in an air-conditioned vehicle. It does the same thing that drinking the cold water does. It's just not a good recipe for success, so that's my advice to you during the summer, and please take it from somebody that knows how to work in the heat, the most extreme heat that you can have. That's how you do it. Give yourself cool-down phases. Make sure you stay hydrated, and as always, hope for the best. Okay, now for the next one is, I don't know if many of you heard the last podcast. I did upload a bad version of that or an unedited version of that uh, last week. The YouTube version was the edited version, but pretty much everything that hit the podcast airwaves was unedited. I was able to get it changed or re-uploaded or whatever, but a bunch of you downloaded it. Several thousand of you actually downloaded the unedited version. Most of the feedback was good on it. Um, I do kind of cuss at myself through these a little bit. Sometimes tell myself to edit that out or whatever and kind of self-edit myself as I do these podcast and you got to hear all of that. But because of that, some of the messaging in there what didn't come across because they weren't edited versions. So that's all been fixed now, and I encourage you to go back and listen to the Memorial Day special. But one of the things I introduced there was a new segment, and it's kind of similar to Casey Kasem's long-distance dedication back from American Top 40. You can look that up and understand it, or go back and look at the podcast and you can and hear all about it. But I actually wanted you guys to start writing in, and somebody actually did already because it's really cool. And the name of the segment is Lawn Care Changes Lives, What's Your Story? And basically what I'm asking is that you write in and tell me, how has lawn care improved your life? Caring for a lawn, tending for a lawn, tending for someone else's lawn, helping someone else out with their lawn. What has lawn care done that has made your life better outside of just having a nice grass and dominating your neighbors? And I know that those are out there because I get stories like that all the time. And our first one comes from Mark M. And Mark is from Morganville, New Jersey. And he and I have actually emailed a few times over the last several months here. So really great that he wrote in, and he's got a great story here. I mean, some things that he is facing even now, I mean, they're just things that I just, I can't even imagine. So let's hear from Mark, ready? Alan, I just got done watching one of your breakout YouTube videos on Lawns Across America, Lawn, cha lawn Care Changes Lives, What's Your Story? And I really wanted to let you know what tending my lawn has done for me and continues to do for me. My background is primarily finance since 1982, so yes, I welcome all of the numbers and analysis that come along with applying products to the lawn and calibrating equipment. After working for other companies for nine years, I became a business owner in 1991 and have owned multiple businesses in different industries since then. I left the finance industry back in 2008. My wife and I downsized our home after one of our two sons went off to college in 2010, and we currently reside in that same house. The last business, which I started back in 2009, I sold in the summer of 2016 and was planned on taking a year off researching business opportunities down in Florida where we have vacationed for the last 25 years. So Mark had his life set up, worked hard. He's an entrepreneur, very successful in those years, learned a lot of things. He's older than me, for sure, <laughs> Mark. And uh, as his kids started getting older, he's like, man, we can start looking now to the future. And we've been vacationing in Florida for 25 years. Let's look to retirement. I mean, how many American families, that's their dream, and that's what they're doing. They're getting to that point where they're like, yeah, we can start to look now to retirement. Let's continue. Mark says, I had a plan, but that plan was unfortunately sidetracked when back in May of 2017, I was diagnosed with a rare form of incurable non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I went through intense chemotherapy treatments throughout the rest of 2017 and then began immunotherapy treatments in January 2018. And those treatments will come to an end in December of this year. Fortunately, I have responded well, resulting in my going from stage four disease to one that is in partial remission. My oncologist is very optimistic based on my response that even in partial remission, it is now very possible for me to keep my levels in check for upwards of 15 to 20 years. This guy's hardcore, man. He's a fighter. Back to the house and property. The house we bought in 2010 had an original exterior dating back to 1978. I mean, everything was original from the single pane storm windows to the roof, and a lot of the interior utilities were quite outdated. The plan was simple, start, build, sell a business within five to 10 years and then make Florida the permanent residence and home to a new business venture while all along not putting too much money into our current home. However, 
with my getting sidetracked and not wanting to leave my team of doctors and nurses here in New Jersey, we have remained in the house to this day. Last year, we decided for various reasons that the plan had to change a little bit, so we redid the entire exterior of the house. I mean, everything is brand new. As far as the lawn was concerned, I really did not give it much attention until last year. The house has an antiquated sprinkler system, which I have yet to turn on, so I use hoses along with the impact sprinklers. By July of last year, we now had a beautiful home with a very crappy looking lawn which constantly got a weekly scalp from a landscaper. I wanted complete curb appeal while at the same time knowing I had to get in the best shape both physically and mentally possible in order to continually battle my health situation. I thought that in addition to walking around my neighborhood a lot, there would be no better way to enhance my exercise program by taking on a lawn project, one which encompasses 15,000 square feet, a project I knew nothing about, where to start and what to do. So he's getting through it. He's got exercise. He's got 15,000 square feet. If you've never handled a 15,000 square foot lawn before, I can promise you, especially if you do what I tell you to do, which is mow twice a week, you will get exercise from that. Mark continues, thankfully, after doing my diligence, I found your YouTube channel. I binge watched your videos over and over again, taking in as much information as I could. I purchased your cool season turf plan and reread that numerous times. I laid everything out in spreadsheets and so began the project. From killing off at least one third of my crabgrass infested lawn with Conclorac in the middle of August to renting a Ryan aerator in the beginning of September to buying the correct fertilizers and next products into overseeding a ton. I followed everything you suggested and had amazing results. Within two months, my lawn looked phenomenal. Right there, guys, anybody can do it. There is absolutely no excuse. So he goes on and he talks about a lot of the equipment that he purchased and everything, and here's where he comes up. He says, I actually purchased a Fitbit in the beginning of last year. It's a great device that monitors everything from caloric and nutritional intake to steps taken and miles traveled each day to even sleep patterns. This device coupled with my lawn maintenance project really helps me a lot. A full day in the lawn yields five miles. So how has lawn care changed my life? With my situation, it has helped me get into great physical shape in order to keep up my perpetual battle against my cancer. I believe I am in the best physical shape right now than I have ever been in my entire life. It has helped me out tremendously, not only physically, but also mentally. Attitude is everything. And trust me, it was not easy dealing with my health situation on a mental basis in the beginning. Over time, I had come to accept my fate but being in the lawn has really helped me to, to de-stress anything and everything. I find it incredibly relaxing and look forward to spending an entire day or two in the lawn per week, sometimes three days. Enjoy the mow? Absolutely. And I enjoy it once every four to five days with earbuds and playlists that last me the entire day. Getting rid of weeds? Sure, a good blanket spray was necessary for my hairy bittercress infestation, but I sure do enjoy just walking the property and casually hand pulling some other weeds if possible from both the lawn and rock beds. Finally, there is nothing better than sitting back on the patio overlooking a beautiful backyard lawn. I'll tell you what, you got to realize, we talk about enjoy the mow, but imagine if you were faced with the opportunity or the possibility of death in the case where they tell you it's non-curable. You'll sure start to enjoy the mow more, won't you? You'll st still start to enjoy those nice evenings of looking at your back lawn and looking at what you've done and the accomplishments that you've made. I don't know. That's incredible. So, Mark, thank you so much, man. I, I can't even... Like I tried to just feel like what it would feel like to, I, I don't, I've never faced anything like that ever in my life. So I don't, I don't know, man. I, I just think it's incredible that you have overcome that. I mean, now your doctors are telling you you're beating it and it's in partial remission. That's, that's, that's freaking crazy, dude. So I know why you can beat the lawn because you beat cancer. Anybody that can beat cancer, they can beat problems in a lawn. So Mark, thanks for writing in. If you guys would like to write in, and also share with us how lawn care has affected you in a positive way or others around you in a positive way, please type it or handwrite it and send it in to me. I do like to read the physical note. I think that's part of the process there. Send that to me at 8955 US Highway 301 North, number 206, Parish, Florida, 34219. 8955 US Highway 301 North, number 206, Parish, Florida, 34219. Okay, now we're going to go out to our recorded questions. And if you would like to call in and possibly have your question answered on the air, you can call us at 833-526-8477. That's the LCN Tips line, 833-LCN Tips, 833-526-8477. We do get quite a few calls on there, but I do try to answer the ones that I think are going to help the most people each week. So if you've got a question, please call in 833-526-8477. And our first one is coming out of a beautiful part of northern Indiana, Goshen, Indiana, Beautiful Amish country up there. Great area. Here we go. Hey, Alan. This is Shane from Goshen, Indiana. Hey, love that you're doing a podcast now. I wanted to call in and ask a quick question. I've been listening and or watching on YouTube for about three years now and have taken my lawn from 
Uh, you know, a decent lawn to one that uh, any lawn care nut could be proud of, but I'm moving to a new house. The yard there is already well established, but there are two large maple trees that in the spring drop what we call whirly birds all over the yard. So I have two questions. The first is what do you do when you are starting in a new yard uh, in, you know, in mid to early summer? What are your tips to start? And then secondly, what do you do about the whirly birds all over the yard? Thanks. All right, Shane, awesome questions. And you know what? Congratulations on your second lawn coming up now. I think that's really cool to look at. I mean, how many lawns do you think you're going to own over your years and over your period of time? And what's cool is so Shane's got a lot of experience. If you look at the DIY space, he's got a couple of years, three years of experience here working on his lawn, and he's done a really good job with it. Now he's got a brand new one, and he's starting to already look ahead. He's already starting to look at what potential challenges might I face. And the first are those dirty maple trees and those Samaras, which you guys call whirly gigs, whirly birds, helicopters. They're basically the seeds falling from the maple trees. I used to have silver maples that were in my parkway over when I back when I lived over by over in Griffith, Indiana, over by there on Glenwood Road. 709 Glenwood is where I used to live, over by Griffith, Indiana, over by there. And we had giant silver maples in the parkway. And so I used to get those helicopters too. And I'm sorry, Shane, there is absolutely nothing you can do about those helicopters besides cut the trees down, which you probably don't want to do. And even if your neighbors have those maples, you can cut the trees down all day long and their helicopters are still going to come into your lawn. So the only thing that you can do is do your best to mow them up. So maybe in the spring when the helicopters are falling heavy, that's when you do choose to mow a little bit lower, bag your clippings, bag them up, suck them up. You might get some little trees growing in the grass. That's where the frequent mowing comes in. They will not grow. They will not become a tree as long as you continue mowing. And eventually, they'll just burn out of gas, and they will go away, and they shouldn't be a problem for you in the summer. But other than that, there is nothing you can do about those troublesome whirly gigs falling in the lawn. Now, as far as where you're going to start with the new lawn, I would say the first thing I would ask you to do is go out and measure that lawn. You're already looking now that you have some maple trees, so I would start looking at what section of my lawn is overly shaded from the maple trees and what kind of grass is growing beneath them. Is it fine fescues in there mostly, which is what I'm going to guess, or maybe they're not shading the whole lawn. Maybe you're getting some sun and that kind of thing. So you got mostly Kentucky bluegrass in there. And you may not even be be able to identify the different cool season grasses that you have, but you can definitely identify how thick they are in different areas of the lawn and how they're growing and how they're doing based on this time of year. So the first thing I would do is definitely get out make yourself a property map and measure each area of your lawn. While you're doing that, be observant of other things too, not just the sun shade, even though that's the most important thing, but look at different areas and how they are responding. What weeds are in here, what weeds are not here. What foot traffic patterns are here that are not there? And why are those foot traffic patterns there? You know, like I've talked about before, maybe people walking out to a shed or whatever, maybe you can make some changes there. But whatever you need to do to start learning your land, that's the idea. Be observant of what it is, how it's progressing, and what it looks like. And I also recommend you take pictures. One of the things I think that we all miss are before pictures. Where is the lawn at when you move in versus where is it after you've worked on it? Because you can use that for before and after pictures. Those are cool. But also so you can refer back to them and go, oh, I used to have a dry spot there I forgot about, or I used to have this or that, or this tree's gotten bigger and it looks like the roots are encroaching and stealing more more, you know, moisture from the soil. Whatever it is, you will notice all of those things if you have before pictures. So that's the first thing I would tell you to do is get yourself a property map and then go ahead and take some pictures. The second thing I would do is to get your irrigation in line. I've talked about this earlier in the podcast but you are coming into summer and you do not know this lawn. You do not know how it's cared for. You don't know what the roots look like. You don't know how it's been, you know, nurtured or not or neglected. So get the irrigation in line. So when it starts to face summer stress, you can keep the water going for it and you can make sure that it's least watered properly. The next thing I would do is I would apply a grub application because we don't want to have to have you dealing with grubs later on in the year. So it's better to just go ahead and take care of that. So that's something that's out of your out of your purview and it's not a concern to you. But the other thing that will do for you, Shane, is it will give you your first foray into applying granular product to your new property. One of the things you're going to learn, and definitely you're going to learn it because it's your last property, you've been taking care of it for these few years, you know the pattern that you spread at. You know how to spread granular product the most efficient way because you've done multiple applications on that property 
property over the years. This is your first time at this new property, and so you're going to have to learn it. And you're probably going to make some mistakes the first time. You're probably going to miss a few spots. Maybe you're going to overlap a little different just because you just don't know. Even, even walk in the property ahead of time. You're going to face obstacles in the lawn that are going to affect the way that you spread, and you'll have to learn how to work around those. And so that's what I would recommend you do is just apply an insecticide first that's not going to burn anything, not going to hurt anything, not going to do anything that way, but it will allow you to understand what it's like to walk that property in application. I was actually watching a video from my friend Grass Daddy Tim. If you guys know Grass Daddy, you can see him on YouTube. Just search Grass Daddy. He actually has a project lawn at a friend of his house, a giant property. It's beautiful. It has ponds on it and all kinds of shrubbery and stuff and looks like grass that kind of weaves in and out of it. And he was putting down some fur there and he said the same thing. He goes, look, I've never done anything at this property before. I'm not sure the best way to apply. So I'm just going to put in some organic fur and just go for it. And that's what I recommend you do. Put in something like that, that you don't have to necessarily worry about it hurting anything, which again, most lawn products are not going to hurt the lawn, but get something like that. That's a little bit of a no brainer and go out there and just spread it like grass daddy did and see what happens. Cause I guarantee you the second time you come back, you will be much more versed and you'll know where to start and what your plan of attack should be. So that is the next thing that I would recommend you do. And all of that has to do with learning your land. So spend the summer, Shane, and learn your land. And then once you know what your land is like, and once you feel comfortable about it, that's when you can set up for fall, because fall is not that far away. It's only, what, 75 days away before you can start, you know, doing, looking at some of those type of things. Let's go ahead and really start getting ahead of it in the fall, but use the summer to set that up. And as always, Shane, let's hope for the best. And now our next one, we got another one from Ohio. The last one we have was in Cincinnati. This one's a little further north in Dayton, Ohio. Again, I said I used to work for True Green up there, but I also be, used to be stationed at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which is also right outside of Dayton. So here we go. Let's hear Brad. Hey, Alan. This is Brad from Dayton, Ohio. I have a uh, mix of a fescue and bluegrass lawn. It's a little two-port thing here. Number one, I haven't really seen a whole lot that you said about getting rid of thistle. I am working on a lawn with my cousin, and she's trying to restore her lawn, and she's having problems with that up by her um, house. And the second part is we've been getting a lot of thunderstorms and stuff recently, so I um, put your little theory to the test, and my grass has darkened up quite a bit. So if you could um, answer my question about that, though, that'd be great. Thank you. Awesome, Brad. So the, let me talk to you guys about the first thing Brad's talking about. In a, in a recent podcast, and I can link in the description below if you're on YouTube or whatever, but I talked about how lightning brings natural nitrogen. When lightning strikes in the air, it creates natural nitrogen that's brought down in rain, and it will green the lawn up when it hits the soil. And he's saying, hey, I tested that out. We got a thunderstorm, and I noticed that my lawn greened up right away. That's exactly right. So the rest of you, I encourage you to do that. Go back and watch that or listen to that piece of the podcast. But the next time you get a lightning storm, go out. Like in the midst of the lightning storm, go out and look at your lawn, and it will be greener from that natural nitrogen. We call that free nitrogen in Florida and we get tons of it. But the other thing that Brad asked about here was he's working with his cousin and she's got a lot of thistle problems. Now, he's right. I don't talk a lot about thistle, but thistle is something I have in my lawn and it's probably most of you are gonna have either Canada thistle or bull thistle. There might be some other ones, but they're all thistle and, they all, they all, uh, and they're all really hard to kill. But I'm gonna go ahead and give you now some tips on getting rid of thistle because I have had a lot of experience with it. When I worked in Northwest Indiana, we had tons of thistle. That was mostly bull thistle up there. And we had tons of it. In fact, I would see it, some of it would get four or five feet tall. People would let it grow like in their shrub beds and stuff and get these giant pink flowers on it. And it would just be horrendous. So thistle can get really out of control, but in a lawn, it is controllable, even though it's not easy. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is when it comes to thistle is you want to figure out, can you eliminate where it's coming from? Now, you might have a lot of farm fields around you where thistle will grow and, and, and things like that and blow around and spread. Nothing you can do about that. However, I've also known that thistle seeds are put into wild bird seeds. So he, you said that, that the, the problem is up by the house. I would, I would ask if there used to be or if there is currently a wild bird feeder up there and possibly that the birds that are eating those thistle seeds are spreading them around or shatting them out. Either way, I believe that a lot of thistle is spread that way because the thistle problems that I have in my lawn are underneath my palm trees where the birds nest. I don't have thistle anywhere else, and I believe that they're eating the seeds from somewhere, and then they are eliminating those seeds as they are up in those trees. They are falling into my lawn, and they are growing. So the first thing you want to do, don't eliminate the birds. I love birds, but if you do have wild bird feeder around there, eliminate that because that might have some thistle seeds in it. So that's just a real quick way that you might be able to get a quick win if I'm right on my guess there. Now, the next thing is, don't try to pull them. And I know that you probably haven't done that, but when I, I have a story, I'd been working at True Green for two weeks. Now you have to understand, I grew up in Florida, so 
And, and we didn't have a lot of thistle here, at least that I ever remember, so I never came across one. And I remember I'd been working at True Green for two weeks, and I was out running estimates on a lawn, and I saw, well, I know now it was a thistle, and I didn't know what it was, and I wanted to understand what it was, so I reached down with my bare hand. My idea was I was going to pull it out, put it in a plastic bag, and take it back to the office and ask my boss, hey, what is this? I'm seeing a lot of these right now on the lawns. However, as soon as I grabbed that thistle, and let me tell you, I grabbed it hard because I wanted to get in and just take out the roots and everything. I learned my lesson very quickly as I yanked back a hand in pain. A thistle will destroy your hand if you go all in on it trying to pull it. So definitely do not do that. But you can control them through mowing. Now, Canada thistle, and I'm not sure about bull thistle, but Canada thistle has underground root system and it spreads and, and it pushes up. So it's a tough one. But either way, this is still going to work no matter what kind of thistle you have. You're just going to have to be diligent with it. And the first thing you want to do is try to mow it out. My first choice against any weed is to try to mow it out because weeds have to get sunlight for photosynthesis to feed their roots so they can spread. And most weeds require a larger leaf surface to fuel themselves. Grass is unique in that it only has to have these long slender blades and it has thousands of them to fuel itself. But weeds being single plants for the most part, or in the case of Canada thistle, a long root system that's sending up single plants, it's got to send up those giant satellite dishes to suck up that sunlight. And so if you're constantly cutting it, constantly cutting it, constantly cutting it, it is having to spend all of its root energy regrowing those leaves, and eventually it's just going to burn out. It's going to run out of energy. So the first thing I want you to do is try to mow it out. Now the next thing is, after you mow, I do want you to spray a weed control, and you want to use 2,4-D in an amine formulation, A-M-I-N-E. It's just going to work a little bit better in the heat of the summer here. So if you can find 2,4-D amine, which you can online, it's cheap, you probably get like a 12% 2,4-D amine. And what you're going to do is mix that up according to the label, and you're going to spot spray the thistle after you cut them. Most weeds I want you to spray before a cut and not cut for a while, but with thistle, I want you to cut them off because what's going to happen is there's still going to be a lot of leaf surface left. That's just the way that a thistle grows. They spread wide and they spread out. So even if you're cutting at you know, three or four inches tall, there's going to be a lot of leaf surface left. But the other thing is, is that the very center stalk of the plant will be exposed because you'll cut it off, and that is a direct line down into the roots. So you're going to take that 2,4-D amine, and you're going to soak it down right into the middle of that. Now, don't go crazy with it, but you're going to give it a squirt right down the middle. And we're, our idea is that we're going to hopefully get that to translocate itself down into the root. Now, it's not a foolproof thing, and it's going to take a few applications. And I also want you to coat the leaves that are left, but I really want you to work on getting it straight down in there, just a nice squirt right in the middle of that cut-off thistle. So in conjunction with mowing and spot spraying that way, I think you'll be able to get rid of your thistle problem fairly easily. Now, if you can't get an amine formulation, you can get speed zone. Speed zone will work very, very well. It's got 2,4-D in it. I think it's an ester formulation. It'll still work just fine. But if you can get the amine formulation, that's going to work a little bit better. So it's a conjunction of mowing and spot spraying will help you get rid of those thistle. Probably the best strategy that I know of. If you have a warm season turf and you're wanting to take on the same strategy, then you can use Celsius. Celsius will do OK on thistle, and you're going to do it the same way. Just know that Celsius is going to be pretty slow, but it's also the same thing. We're going to mow it out, and we're going to spray it out. We're going to spray right in the center of that cutoff stock and try to get that product to translocate itself down through the root to kill it out from the bottom. If you keep on that and you keep working on it, eventually it'll, it'll burn out of there, and then hopefully maybe there's some other ways you can prevent it from coming back, and then that way you guys can hope for the best. All right, our next one is very different from what we talk about. It's a completely different strategy. It can only be done in certain places, and this one is coming from Joe in Seattle. Hey, Alan. This is Joe in Seattle, Washington. I've got a quick question for you. So I have a Northwest mix. It's like a sunshade uh, mix of Kentucky bluegrass, rye, and fescue. Right now, we're heading into about the summer months, and I've been noticing that there's been a lot of thinning out since the spring. I did overseed in the spring, and I'm starting to notice that there's areas that just aren't filling in or haven't filled in. And I wanted to ask, does it make sense to go ahead and try and fill in those areas knowing that we're heading into the summer? I know that I will have the ability to keep it wet uh, because I do have an irrigation system. But just wanted to know, does it make sense to hold off into the fall or is it something that I can pursue now? What steps do I have to take to make sure that it stays strong throughout the summer? All right, love the podcast. Thanks. Bye. Okay, Joe, thanks for this question because where you live, you can take on a completely different strategy than most people in the rest of the country. But the first thing I want to say is I keyed in on the first part of your question. You said that you seed it in the spring, but the grass seems to be thinning out. So if that's the case, 
I would ask that you make sure that the seed that you used was not an annual mix. This happens a lot. People will buy, you know, annual ryegrass as like an overseed. And, and they sell that in a lot of places. It's like a quick grow. So look at the seed that you have. And if you see the word annual on there, get rid of that and go get perennial ryegrass. And by the way, rye does really well in the Pacific Northwest. That's what a lot of Pacific Northwest blends have in them are a lot of improved ryegrasses. So that's the first thing. Now, you did kind of correct that though as you went on and you said that it seems more like as you're coming out of spring, there's areas that just didn't fill in the way that you thought. And if that's the case, fine. I just wanted you to go ahead and double check your seed. Now with that, for 99% of you that listen to this podcast or watch my videos, I tell you, do not seed in the spring. And the reason I tell you not to seed in the spring is because even if you water a whole lot, what's going to happen is sometime within the next 30 or 45 or even 50 days, you're going to get that hot spell that we've been talking about over 90 and it's going to be super sunny and your grass that has grown is not going to be strong enough to resist the heat. If you think about your existing turf that may have been in the lawn for 40 or 50 years or 10 years or 12 years, and it fades out in heat, imagine what grass that's only been established for, you know, 30 or 45 days is going to do. It's going to be a different prospect. It's not going to be able to handle the heat, and it is going to suffer. But in the case of our friend Joe here, I actually did a little bit more research because I don't know Seattle, Washington very well. And look at what I found here. In August, the average high temperature in Seattle is 72 and the average low is 57. Same way in July. So to me, July and August are the hottest months, right? Average in Seattle, 72 high, 57 low. That is actually perfect growing conditions for cool season turf. So you, Joe, you actually have an opportunity here that doesn't exist for anybody. The only other person I know that would have this same opportunity would be Connor Ward. He lives up in the mountains of Utah, and I don't think it ever gets much above 75 where he lives either. So if you live in an area like that, your strategy can completely change because I also bet that crabgrass is not as much of a problem for you as well. You may have some problems with crabgrass, but I bet it's not as much as areas that get a lot hotter. So with that, your strategy can change. And for sure, I would say, Joe, because Joe, one thing that he said is, is that he does have irrigation. I would say, Joe, that you might want to take on a seeding first type strategy. So normally, whereas I talk about getting the lawn thick by pushing it really hard with nitrogen, what I would say for your lawn is you might want to push it really hard with grass seed and supplement with nitrogen. In other words, seed now, wait a month, seed again, wait a month, seed again, wait a month, seed again. Just keep seeding year round and just let the, let the strong survive. Let everybody sort itself out in there. You know, who's going to be the one that grows is the one that grows. Knowing that your temperatures are great. Your temperatures are optimum for growing grass. Now, obviously, water is going to be key. Seed to soil contact is going to be key. So if you can do something to improve your seed to soil contact, like maybe you, you run your mower after you seed, you run your mower across mulching mode and get it all settled in. That's probably a good idea. Maybe for the first couple of weeks, you're watering every day. Uh, hopefully you'll have some cloud cover, which I think you probably do in Seattle, which will help you. The idea though with seed is you got to keep it wet. So that's your challenge is can you afford the water bills? Do you want to keep it watered? Are you going to get rain help? And if you are, then you could continue seeding because you have those mild temperatures and you really have an opportunity that very few other people have, Joe. So I would say, yeah, man, go for it. Let me know how it turns out. I don't know anyone that's done a seeding first type strategy, but I definitely know in your climate that it could work. The only thing that I would say is because you have seeded in the spring and because you're going to continue seeding during the summer is that you may get a little crabgrass breakthrough. You'll have to see if crabgrass is a problem in your area, but if so, you just get a little quinclorac and you spot spray. Now the quinclorac that you spot spray, if you're using perennial rye or Kentucky blue, it will kill the grass. The label on quinclorac says 28 days after you see it emerge, you have to wait 28 days to spray quinclorac or you could have some injury. However, in your case, you're going to always be seeding. So I would say that sacrificing a few soldiers to kill some crabgrass around it is probably fine. That's a different strategy as well. So go ahead and spray the quinclorac, spot it as you need. If you lose a little bit of your new perennial rye, you do, but you don't want the crabgrass coming in. Same would go with other broadleaf weeds. I don't know what you're dealing with out there, but any weed control that you use could affect that new seed. So no blanket spray spot sprays are fine or hand pulling so again a different strategy to go at but you're someone that can do that joe and i think that if you try that you should definitely update us because i would love to know how it happens a seeding first strategy and as always let's hope for the best okay for our last one for the day we're going to go back to my friends in indiana we're going to go over by northwest indiana we had two from ohio today and two from indiana just how they kind of came in but we're going to talk about signal words on labels and chemicals and pesticides and things like that. And we're gonna dig into this a little bit more than we ever have, but I think it'll be really good for you guys and I think you'll get a lot out of it. So let's go now out to Lowell, Indiana, and let's listen to Robert. Hey, Alan, it's Robert from good old Cedar Tucky, Indiana. That's Cedar Lake. 
Uh, for people who aren't in Northwest Indiana, I've got a question on granular and liquid fertilizers that are not pet safe. Um, been trying to use Morganite or Ringer or organic products, but sometimes for other diseases, scrubs, uh, crabgrass preventative and whatnot, you have to use non-pet safe products. What's a good rule of thumb for keeping your lawn safe for kids or pets after putting down some sort of liquid or granular fertilizer? How much water do you need before you should let, you know, the kids and the dogs play on it again? Thank you. Keep up the awesome work. Bye. Robert, thanks, man. Yeah, people do call Cedar Lake Cedar Tucky, even though last time I was in Cedar Lake, there was a lot of new construction down there, a lot of young families moving down there. Cedar Lake is really coming along. I did not spend a lot of time in Cedar Lake. I know there's a restaurant out there that people eat at that's really nice. But I used to drive through Cedar Lake on my way out to Lowell to D.C.'s Country Junction. Look that one up, D.C.'s Country Junction. It's closed now, but that was a really fun place to go back in the early 2000s and late 90s. With that, let's talk about chemicals today. Let's talk about safety. I've talked about this before, but we're going to talk about it a little different way today. And I think it's important to always be addressing this because I want to make sure that you guys are educated and you're not scared. But I also want to make sure that you respect the products that we use. That's very, very important, and that's why I take the time to dig into the things that we do. So the first thing is fertilizers are chemicals, herbicides are chemicals, water is a chemical. So don't be afraid of the word chemical necessarily. What I would say is look for the ides. The things that you're going to want to have a little bit more concern over are things that end in ide, pesticides, right? So pesticides would be herbicides that kill plants. They would be fungicides that kill or stop fungus. They would be insecticides that kill or stop insects. Those are things that are going to adversely affect another living thing by killing it on contact or by limiting its growth or its ability to feed. They are things that are literally going to destroy another organism. Those are your ides. And those are typically where you're going to have signal words that we're going to talk about today. So what, I, what I'm getting at there is, is I don't want you to worry about things like fertilizers. Now, can people be allergic to things? Yes, they can. People can be allergic to anything. There are people that are allergic to organic peanuts. Even though they're organic, if you're allergic to peanuts, you're allergic to peanuts. It doesn't matter if it's organic or if it's made with pesticides, you are allergic to peanuts. So nothing is safe when it comes to that. However, fertilizers don't have any ides in them. Well, some do, but for the most part, fertilizers like Carbon X, Melorganite, Scott's Turf Builder, Lawn Food, these do not have any ides in them. They do not have pesticides in them. So for the most part, they're not going to hurt you. Now, I would say that after you put down a granular application of Carbon X, you should water it in, though, because you don't want your dog going out and getting it all over his fur and tracking it into your house right? So those are some things you look for there. The other things that you don't need to be concerned about are soil amendments, things like humic acid, fulvic acid, sea kelp. People get wor like worried about the word humic acid, but it's, it comes from lenardite shale. Lenardite shale is actually natural in the environment, and when they process it down, humic acid is actually a carbon source for the soil. So it is not something to worry about. Just because it says it's an acid, that's just the form that it's in. That's just the state that it's in. It's just acidic, but it isn't like some sort of acid that's going to burn your face off. I mean, orange juice is acidic as well. So just, so just think about those things as you're going along. Now let's talk about the ides pesticides, because I think that's really more what we're getting at here. So I want to give you a buzzword today, and it's one that we're going to define, and it's one that you can look up. And the word is acute toxicity, A-C-U-T, acute toxicity. This would be in opposition or as opposed to chronic toxicity. So let me give you the definition of acute toxicity. Acute toxicity describes the adverse effects of a substance that result either from a single exposure or from multiple exposures in a short period of time. So think of acute as one time or one small period of time, but short periods of time. That's acute toxicity. I get it on me once, what does it do to me? That's acute toxicity. Chronic toxicity describes the adverse health effects from repeated exposures, often at lower levels, to a substance over a longer period of time, like months or years. So as a homeowner, we're not necessarily concerned about chronic toxicity because we are only applying you know, fungicides, for example. Maybe you do it twice a year. So in 10 years, you may only have to do 20 applications. That's nothing, literally nothing right? Especially because you're not going to get it on you because you're going to wear your PPE, your personal protective equipment. That's the other side of it, right? Lawn applicators are more worried about chronic toxicity. Guys that do 20, 30 lawns a day for 25 years, they would be more concerned about chronic toxicity. And by the way, those guys spray the same products that you do. 
and they don't have any problems. I worked for True Green for many years, and we did blood draws. I remember during the late 90s, and no problems there. So you're not concerned about chronic technology, chronic toxicity, <laughs> but I figured I would share that with you. So that's the first thing, acute toxicity. Now, what about acute toxicity? Well, the EPA, when, they, uh, when a product wants to come to market, the EPA has to give that product a registration number, and they have to approve the label, and the label has to have signal words on it. At least it does when it comes to IDES, pesticides. And there are five categories that determine a product's acute toxicity. So they measure these things to understand, hey, if this gets on the person or gets in their eyes or they ingest it, and we'll talk about that, is it going to hurt them and how? And how dangerous is it? How much danger is there? How much harm can come if these things happen? So the first thing is, let me tell you the five categories that they measure acute toxicity. And the first is oral ingestion. So you get it in your mouth, and that would be a systemic type reaction, interior. The other would be on your skin. If you get it on your skin and it absorbs into your system, what can it do? The third would be inhalation. You inhale the fumes of it, it gets into your lungs. What can it do over a period of like four hours to you? And then there are two that are more on contact or visual, and that would be eye contact. When it gets in your eyes, what does it do? Does it make them crust up or turn red, or what does it do? Does it burn your eyes? And then the second would be skin contact. Does it cause a rash or cause red bumps? So those are the five different ways that they measure acute toxicity. Three are systemic, oral, skin, and inhalation, and then two are contact, eye and skin. So that's what they do. They look at those five ways. They test it. Now, I don't know who gets these tests. I don't know how these things are tested. I wouldn't want to be the guy that, you know, volunteers to have it put in my eye. That's a whole other thing that somebody could research. I have no idea how that happens, but I ain't going to be the guy that volunteers for it, but I'm glad that somebody did. But those are how they look at acute toxicity. Now, I will tell you, just from my experience, there are three primary ways that these products or chemicals or IDES, pesticides, will come in contact with an applicator. That could be you, or in my case, it was my guys at True Green. I will tell you the three most common ways that I saw them experience acute toxicity from different products. And the first was, and, and by the way, it almost always stemmed from it getting on their hands. Either they wouldn't wear their gloves or they would wear gloves with a rip in them and they wouldn't want to replace them. Or sometimes they would have their gloves off and somewhere on the truck would have the product on it and they wouldn't realize and it would get on their hands. So the first one was it would get on their hands and they would eat something and they would ingest it. I would see that happen. The second would be that they would have it on their hands and they would smoke a cigarette. And the same thing would happen. They would get it on their lips and it would get in and they would get it in that way. And the third that I would see is it would be on their hands and they would go use the urinal and it would ingest through the thinner skin that way. Of course, fumes are also something, but I didn't see a lot of guys have problems with that. So those are some areas that you might want to think about. Even if you're wearing gloves, you always want to wash your hands before you eat, smoke, or put your hands on any other part of your body or any other person or anything else. Always wash your hands, even if you wear your PPE. That said, though, once the acute toxicity is tested, then each product, each IDE, each pesticide is assigned a toxicity category, and they go from one to four, one being the worst and four being, hey, no problem over by it air. So the signal word you would see on a toxicity category of one would be danger, and a lot of times you're going to see skull and crossbones in that. I can tell you right now, you will not be able to buy any products like that for your lawn. You should never have to buy any products like that for your lawn, and I hope that you never do. The second one would be warning, the third would be caution, and then the fourth would be none required. So most of the products that are available to us as homeowners are going to have the signal word caution, which is the third you know, least harmful or third least toxic of all. There are four categories. One is the worst, four is the least. And in fact, if your eyed or your product is said to be a category for toxicity, it doesn't require any signal words on the label at all. However, almost all of the weed controls, fungicides, insecticides that you and I use, they're going to have the word caution on them. They are a category three for the most part. In fact, I looked around and just did a quick search. I couldn't find anything but caution. I found no warnings, definitely no dangers uh, on anything that's available to us. So when it's all said and done, what you want to look at then is that signal word. And again, it's going to be caution. Now, what will happen is, though, on the label, they will tell you what the caution means. Because here's the other thing. They run through the five categories. And as they run through the five categories, the one that has the worst toxic effect is the one that's going to dictate what category it's in. And I'll just 
define this real quick because it's getting a little bit complicated. But let's say you have a brand new weed control that you want to bring on the market. You bring it to market. You go to EPA. They start testing it during those five toxicity levels. And it doesn't do anything when it gets on the skin. It doesn't do anything systemically. And it doesn't cause any red rashes. When you breathe in the fumes, it doesn't cause anything there. Um, however, if you do swallow a little bit of it or you get it in your eyes, it does pose some harm. It does cause some harm. So because of those two things there being causing some harm, they would assign that a caution statement. So the entire product has to have the word caution on it. Now let's say that that same product though, let's say that it got on the skin and it caused some redness. So they're going to give it a caution word, but when it gets in the eyes, it actually causes temporary blindness. Then that would be a danger word. That would be a category one. Then that means danger has to show up on the lab, on the label. What I'm trying to say is, is the highest level of toxicity out of the test dictates what signal word shows up on the label. I hope that makes sense. But again, everything that you and I use, the worst it's going to have is caution. So just knowing right there, out of the toxicity categories, everything that we use is a category three, which out of the four is the third least disruptive or dangerous. I'm trying to use, I'm trying to dance around my words here, but you guys are getting it. So once you know that, then you can go and look for those signal words on your product and turn it over and look at the rest of the label. And then the next thing you want to look for is precautionary statements. Every label will have precautionary statements on there. And that's where you're going to find more detail around the signal word, which in our case is mostly going to be caution. So I pulled a few labels here. I pulled the Cutter Backyard Insect and Mosquito Backyard Spray that we used in the video that I just did last week where I talked about killing mosquitoes in the grass and all around the property because that's a big spray, spray the entire property. So a lot of people are like, hey, do I let my dogs go on that? Whatever, whatever. And so I looked at the precautionary statements and here's what they say. So on the front of the label, by the way, the, the signal word will always be on the front of the package, usually down towards the bottom. And I can see here on the cutter backyard, caution, see back for details. And here I am on the back of the label, precautionary statements, hazards to humans and domestic animals, caution. And they define the word caution. Harmful if swallowed, causes moderate eye irritation, avoid contact with eyes or clothing, wash hands thoroughly with soap and water after handling and before eating, drinking, chewy gum, or using tobacco. So this product tells me that if I'm going to be concerned with it, I don't want to swallow it and it could cause moderate eye irritation. Now, what you'll find on this label is they also uh, out add a little bit more. They have a little icon with a guy walking a dog. I love iconography, by the way. I think that iconography is, a, is a, an art form that is underappreciated, but on there, they have an icon of a little guy walking a, looks like a border collie, and it says, do not allow children or pets into treated area until dry. So let's just use a little bit of logic. The precautionary statement is caution, and it says it's harmful if swallowed, but it also says causes moderate eye irritation. Well, if you have a dog, like uh, my parents have a Shih Tzu, and that Shih Tzu has no nose, so everything that she sniffs in the grass rubs in her eyes. And by the way, I think Shih Tzus actually have eye problems because of that, not because of chemicals, but because just grass and everything else that they sniff scrapes their eyes, and over years and years and years, it causes them to go blind. I think Boston Terriers and a lot of other, other breeds have that challenge, but if you just sprayed this product out there and your dog is out there sniffing and the wet grass with the product on it gets in the dog's eyes, it can be an irritant. Same with your children. You know, children put their hands on everything and are always putting their hands in their mouth, and that's why it says harmful with swallowed, if swallowed. So what they're saying is just don't allow them on there until it's dry because once it's dry, then that seems to not be a problem anymore. That caution is no longer valid because it's dried up. It's, there's no way for that product now to get into their eyes or for them to ingest it. And so that's why they use those words. So that's one example of a label. Let's look at another one. Let's look at Celsius herbicide. So Celsius, Celsius is a professional formulation. I always use air quotes when I say that. But it's a professional formulation of a weed control that we use on warm season turf. And it also has the word caution. So this is a professional level product. And on the front label, it says, stop, read the label before use, keep out of reach of children. By the way, you should keep all this out of the reach of children, but the word on there is caution. So I go to the back of the label and it says, precautionary statements, hazard to humans and domestic animals, caution, causes moderate eye irritation, avoid contact with eyes or clothing, harmful if swallowed, wash thoroughly with soap and water after handling and before eating, drinking, or using tobacco, chewing gum, or using the toilet. See, they know. They know the same thing I do, those professionals. Don't use that toilet. So same exact thing. You would Now, they don't give you any extra 
I didn't look if there was any kind of re-entry precautions on this because that's the other thing you're going to want to look for is what the re-entry precautions are. You can just command F6 on the label and search for the word re-entry precautions. It will tell you to let it dry or wait an hour. It'll tell you whatever there is there, but I just wanted to go ahead and read again. The signal word, even on a professional herbicide, is very similar to the over-the-counter herbicide we just looked at. Okay, so let's look at one last one here. I know this one can be polarizing, so I pulled a 41% glyphosate product. This is called Eraser, but you know it's just 41% glyphosate like anything else. And guess what the signal word is on the front of glyphosate? Just guess. Remember, we talked about the different signal words, right? And being the most dangerous would have danger. The second most dangerous would have warning. The third would have caution. And then number four would have no required signal word. So what do you think the required signal word would be on a glyphosate, 41% glyphosate product? That's right, caution. Same word as the others. Precautionary statements. Hazards to humans and domestic animals. Harmful if inhaled. Causes moderate eye irritation. Avoid breathing spray mist. Avoid contact with eyes or clothing. So same thing. That's why you don't stick your nose into a bottle of product and suck it out with your nose. You don't do that. What do you do? <laughs> you just don't do that. This will tell you that those fumes are bothered. Now, will the mixed product fumes bother? You know, I've sprayed glyphosate before and it doesn't bother me, but it is something you might want to consider. And I didn't read the whole label here, but they may have some different PPE with this. They may tell you to wear a mask. Every product is a little different. That's why these precautionary statements lead right into the next two things you should look at in the label, which we're not going to explore today, but we may in the future. And once you understand your caution words or your signal words, then you go to the next step, which is what is my personal protective equipment that I wear when applying this? And then what are my re-entry periods? How long do I need to stay out of the area before I can myself go back in or let my kids? And then the third is, is how to handle any clothing that you may have used during that period. But the best advice I can give you is just don't get it on you. Don't spray when it's windy. Be careful when you walk. Wear rubber boots and you'll be fine. Just don't get it on you. But I figured that would be a good thing to go down. I figured that'd be something different to look at are those signal words on the products. And again, as long as you're following label directions, everything that you do poses a negligible risk and you should be fine. And as always, we're going to hope for the best. With that, I'm going to end it there. I would like to thank you all for joining me as we're moving into summer here. I hope this podcast has been helpful to you. I hope you've gotten a lot out of it. Don't forget, you can always get more information on thelawncarenut.com. If you need a lawn plan, go there, thelawncarenut.com. Look under lawn plans. I've got a full YouTube channel for you, as well as I also have a weekly email newsletter that backs up this podcast and everything I do on the Lawn Care Nut YouTube channel. So with that, thanks for listening. I'm Alan Hayne, the Lawn Care Nut, and I'll see you in the lawn.